and now an esteemed author, uh, Dr. James Zogby. Uh, just so everyone knows, Jim will be staying, or Dr. James Zogby is going to be staying here to sign all your books, <coughs> and he'll also be staying here. We have a little, we have a nice little spread out there. If you can see that, we have baklava and Pepsi's and beer. No, no. <laughs> that was my desire, but they didn't bring it in. <coughs> but it, it really gives me uh, a, a lot of pride to introduce a good friend of mine, Dr. Jim Zogby. I've known uh, Jim Zogby since the mid-80s, and uh, Jim has been one of those people who, who's an accomplished uh, uh, academic, academic uh, uh, academician. I'm losing my train of thought. But, <coughs> And I don't know if many people know that Jim received a PhD from Temple University uh, in Islamic uh, law or history or something, <laughs> Islamic studies at the religion department under the great Dr. Ismail Far Farooqi, if anybody remembers Dr. Farooqi. So in a lot of ways, we can, as Philadelphians can claim Jim as one of our own. Uh, Jim has had a stellar career. Uh, not in academia, I mean he had a good career in academia, but Jim has been one of those people who has taken his academic degree and made it into a real policy degree in that he now runs, co-founded and or runs some of the major Arab American institutions from the Palestinian Human Rights Campaign, the Arab American Discrimination Committee, the Arab American Institute, where Jim is really on the cutting edge of the Arab American political mobilization in the United States. And this book is wonderful. I really urge you all to read it. It, it really shatters the myths of the Arab Americans in, uh, that we see and so prevalent amongst our uh, policymakers. So, but you don't come here, you didn't come here to hear me. <laughs> so I would like to introduce my good friend, my esteemed colleague, Jim Zogby. <coughs> Thank you, Marwan. Whenever anyone uses the term cutting edge, the, the, one of my favorite lines in Dragnet was Dan Aykroyd referring to the, the Yugo as being on the cutting edge of Serbo-Croatian technology. <laughs> um, anyway, it's very hard speaking in a library. I, um, I'm con one is conditioned to want to whisper, and so I apologize. I'm sorry. Um, I, I thank you for hosting me. This is uh, uh, part of a national book tour that I'm doing, and when I, Marwan said, come to Villanova, I said, yes, because it's a family school. I've had so many relatives, um, uncles and cousins, uh, godfather, um, et cetera, all of whom came here, that uh, to turn down a, an invitation to Villanova would be almost blasphemous for me. So I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be here um, and honored that you came to hear me talk about my book. Um, I have been writing the book for most of my life. I've, I've written other books, but this one is one that was near and dear to my heart. Also was one that uh, got turned down by publishers uh, a number of times over the years, and uh, finally found a, a wonderful group at uh, Paul Gray McMillan, um, who said it was, the, it was the time to do it. Uh, I think I, to some degree, can thank George Bush for for some of that. Um, when the hole gets awfully deep, people start looking for a way to get out, and um, I, I may just uh, have appeared to them as somebody who had some ideas uh, about, uh, about how to do that. Uh, the book for me is about a number of stories that I've wanted to tell. Um, people uh, that I want to introduce folks to, some very memorable characters uh, that I've met over the years. Um, who taught me lessons that I wanted to share. Um, one of whom I keep thinking of uh, as I've been doing this, uh, an old woman that I met uh, in a refugee camp back in 1971 when I got a grant from Temple to do some summer research. Um, and I was in the camp to collect stories of refugees from their 48 experience onward. Uh, I was doing a project Though at Temple, looking at my dissertation, I was also, um, I, I'm not an overachiever, but I'm, I, I, what's the word I want? 
crazy. I, I, I don't know limits. I was at Temple, but I was also, I got a National Defense Education Act grant to University of Pennsylvania, a fellowship to Pennsylvania. So I was taking courses at Temple, teaching two courses at Temple, and taking four courses at University of Pennsylvania, and got this summer grant. I was working with Anthony Wallace at University of Pennsylvania in revitalization movements. I wanted to see what was happening to Palestinians in the camps in terms of revitalization. Were the pressures and stress that they were living under creating any kind of new conditions for kind of a, a new social consciousness? And anyway, I was in the camps and I was working with this old woman who was introducing me to other families. And I spent a number of weeks there collecting stories and documenting them. And at the end, I left. But as I was leaving the camp, she grabbed my arm and she stared at me and she said, we've told you everything. What are you going to do about it? The book is about listening. It's about the importance of listening. It's about not getting your response ready while the other person's talking, something my mother would always chide me for. She'd say, you're not listening to me. You're already, I can see you forming the answer. Um, it's about paying attention to what people are saying so that they will better hear us because if we listen to them, then we understand better how to communicate with other people. But it also, from the lesson I learned from that old woman, if you really listen, then you end up having a responsibility for what you hear. And as my wife and I said on the flight on the way home, as we looked at each other, having gone through this experience together, our lives were never going to be the same. And they weren't. I went, finished the PhD, taught for a number of years, but she haunted me and the experience haunted me and made me want to do something about it. And so my activism was born in response to, to Om Abed, who I, I could never forget for having changed my life. Um, it's about people. It's also, um, it's about some hard data that we can't ignore. Um, and I want to share some of that with you just in three different capsules. The first is uh, an expression I use all the time. Um, I've been using it actually for 20 years. It was true then and it's, it's truer today. Um, I say it this way. Since the end of the Vietnam War, we have <laughs> sent more money, we have sent more weapons, we have sent more troops, we have fought more wars, we have lost more lives, we have more critical national security interests at risk, and we have more economic interests at stake in that part of the world than anywhere else. And every U.S. president since then has expended major diplomatic capital in that world, and yet we don't know very much about it. And it remains not just an enigma, but we are largely ignorant of the realities of the Middle East. And in a poll we did for the book, uh, we asked the question, people to try to find Iraq, identify where Iraq is. 37% of Americans today know where Iraq is on a map. When the war was started, 11% could find it on a map. Um, that's gone up, but we lost 4,400 troops, what, to gain 26% of knowing where it is? We didn't even dare ask where Afghanistan was. And only about a third of the American people know the year Israel declared its independence. <coughs> Most of the people we interviewed couldn't identify the countries around Israel, know, know where they are or who they are. Knew some of them, but certainly not all of them. But 60% didn't know that Iran or Pakistan weren't Arab countries. <coughs> didn't know what it meant to be an Arab country versus not an Arab country, etc. The level of not knowing is great. And the problem is, is that when we started polling these kinds of issues here in the States, we used to get over 75% of the American people saying, I need to know more. Thank God the number is still around 59 or 60 percent, but that drop is a dangerous one. It reminds me of a, a comment that uh, um, Stephen Hawkins used to make about the most dangerous thing is an ignorance, but it's ignorance that is certain, that thinks it knows. Um, and we are in a dangerous situation because we began asking serious questions in this country about the Middle East. But almost immediately as we began answer, asking, people provided us with the easy answer. Why do they hate us? They hate our values, was the answer. And we 
started with a baseline of not knowing and then <coughs> built on that myths that justified our not It wasn't us, it was them. It wasn't that we didn't know, we did know, and they fit this stereotype that we already had figured out for them. And so as I start looking at the, the data to look to, to, to deal with this, what we did was we instead of just providing a collection of anecdotes, which you can always do, I mean I met this guy, he said this, I mean Tom Friedman has made a career out of anecdotes. I call it bad science. You take an observation and you elevate it into a conclusion, like all black people run fast or you know, all Hispanics are this or all Jews are that, whatever. It's, it's basically prejudice that passes itself as intelligence, but it's not because it doesn't take into, a, into account diversity. Uh, it doesn't take into account the real flesh and blood of life. And so we took a different approach. We poll. And I like polling. Uh, I like polling because it's respectful. It takes 4,000 people. It asks them questions. It logs the answers to their questions. It organizes the data by country, by gender, by age, by education level. And then it gives you back a nuanced portrait of a people. We resent when people in the other parts of the world that we deal with say, well, all Americans are this, or you're, all your people are that, or you Americans. Well, they, there's no such thing as you Americans. Well, there's also no such thing as you Arabs, uh, or those Arabs, or sort of categorizing them as if they're a lump that can all be seen through a stereotypical lens that portrays them as one thing. And so when we poll, we end up with a picture. A picture of real people with real feelings and real aspirations that you can measure. And, and so I start with the hard data. And the hard data also gives us data points that I want to share. It, we've got the data point of the, the fact of our interest. We've got the data point of the, the amount that we don't know. And then there's the data point of what we ought to be knowing. And so I look at myths, the, the five great myths that we have about the Arab world. The, the first one being they're all the same. And if you take a book like Raphael Patai's The Arab Mind, which was used up until recently by US military in Iraq. I mean, it was considered the handbook on the Arab mind, how to deal with them. And there are those who believe quite seriously that Abu Ghraib is a result of this. If you think that there is a type, and the type can be understood through this and that behavior, i.e., they best understand force they best understand humiliation. And the best humiliation is sexual humiliation. It'll get them to do whatever you want. It, 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 it was both wrong. It was, um, I mean, in, in the sense that, I guess, humiliation and sexual degradation would apply to almost anybody in any culture. Um, I mean, if you did to any group of people what was done in Abu Ghraib, I guess you'd get some results. I'm not sure you'd like the, the picture you end up with, but that's what we ended up doing. But it was based on an understanding, believe it or not, that this is how they are. If you read Tom Friedman's um, 15 Mideast Rules to Live by, an article he wrote in 2006 uh, in the midpoint of the Gulf War, it was all about they are like this, rule number one. They're like this, they're like that. They're not, they're not more violent, they're not more angry, they're not more deceitful, they're not more... I mean, those kinds of things, if said about another group of people, we'd understand as bigoted. You know, I've just been asking, been being asked questions about um, uh, Juan Williams uh, and his comments on NPR. I'm not, I, on, on, um, uh, on Fox, rather, I, I'm not going to um, defend how NPR dealt with it or didn't deal with it or what they did. But when Politico asked me to write a little piece on it, I just took exactly his words, exactly his words, and I crossed out Muslim and I put in Jew. And I crossed out Muslim again and I put in black. And I said, it's a lesson I learned a long time ago. If you put do either one of those and it makes you wince, and you say, ooh, that's awful, no one should ever say that, then don't use it for anybody else. 
the lesson is not just an application toward Muslim or Arab. It is a point that don't ever typecast any group of people as having that set of characteristics or any set of characteristics. And so the, that's the first of the myths. And so when we ask questions, are they all the same? We find an incredible array of diversity in the Arab world. It sort of defeats that notion that they're all alike. For example, we ask questions, what's the, what do you like about your country best? Or what do you don't like about your country best? And what are the, the um, what do you, are you better off than you were four years ago? The, the sort of what I call them the Reagan questions that he asked of Jimmy, voters to ask of Jimmy Carter. And, and at the end of that, we then look at them. And the, Moroc the Moroccan answers are wildly different than the Egyptian answers. And different again than the, the answers from Lebanon or Jordan. And you discover that there's a unique cultural background in each of those places that sort of add to a flavor. It's like a different spicing of life. Um, I both do a little bit of a portrait of each of the countries because I think one ought to see or feel the, the noise of Cairo or the, 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 the kind of the, the, the reconstructed life, and I mean that in the, in the literal and figurative sense of, of Lebanon, or this sort of sense of un, unlimited imagination of UAE. There are differences taking place around the country, around the countries of the Middle East that are extraordinary. We have to understand that. But the second great myth is sort of the reverse twist on that. It's that they're also different, that they're not a people at all. And we poll on that. Yes, there's enormous diversity, but there also are common threads. There also are, there's a common language which connotes a common history and forces that have shaped this. I mean, you know, to the same degree that no Guatemalans are not the same as Salvadorians, but there is something about having a common language that comes from a common history that gives certain threads to life that are shared and that bring people in different circumstances together. Um, in the Arab world, I think it's obvious that there are issues. We ask people, what are the issues that you share with other Arabs? When people say that Iraq is important to them in Morocco, and we say, why? And they say, because they're Arabs like us. Well, that means something. And I think one of the mistakes we make at great risk to our country is to ignore those common threads and assume either, I mean, and this last administration was weird in, in the sense that on the one hand they thought we'll overthrow the regime in Iraq, we'll set up a democracy, it'll bloom across the Middle East, it'll be a beacon lighting up the whole region as if they're all the same. But then on the other hand they believed that what happened here would have no impact over there. So they could do this to Palestinians, or do that in Lebanon, or do this in Iraq, and that nobody else in the region would care. But the reality is, is that they did care. They cared deeply about what happened in Lebanon in 2006. They cared deeply about what happens to Palestinians, and they cared deeply what happens to Iraq. And the result is, is that it has taken a deep toll on us, as well as on them, and the, the reality of their, their lives. The third of the, the myths that I deal with is the that they're all angry and that they hate us, which is the one that actually, in, even in polling that we do, when we say, why do Arabs dislike us? Or, why are attitudes towards Arabs unfavorable to us? The, the overwhelming answer we get is they hate our values. That was crystallized, I think, an expression in the last administration, that they hate our values. Actually, we began polling on this question in 2002, and we asked specifically how they feel about American values of democracy and, and freedom. And the answers are very high. How do you feel about the American people? The numbers are high. How do you feel about American products? The numbers are high. Actually, the numbers are high across the board, except when you begin asking, how do you feel about American policy toward this, and American policy toward that? The numbers are very low. And then the overall attitude toward America is also low. Now, uh, for those of you old enough, you're not, um, during the Clinton years, um, his numbers were very high for a period of time. Monica Lewinsky drove his numbers down. It had nothing to do with his economic policy, had nothing to do with um, his foreign policy, but that Monica Lewinsky and behavior became a drag on the rest of his numbers. Similarly, George Bush's numbers in the summer of 2001 were at 43%, but 9-11 and his leadership after 9-11 drove his numbers up into the 80% range. There was one funny question that Gallup asked. Uh, they asked the question, and it was just a test on this pull or drag of polling numbers. They said, who reads more books, Bill Clinton or George Bush? 
George Bush won. And what it was was that the, the, the pull of favorable attitudes meant that almost any question at that point you asked, you were going to get a great number for him. And in reverse, about Clinton back then, almost anything you asked was going to get, in contrast, a negative number because the negative was still there. And that's the situation here. They love our values, they love our people, they love our products, they don't like our policy, and our policy drags the rest of the number down. The rest of the numbers down. I wrote an article back then after we did our first poll and I called it, It's the Policy Stupid. Um, it's not our values. It's not who we are. It's not the fact that we give women rights and they hate that, or that we vote in election and they hate that. Um, that has nothing to do with their attitude. It may have to do with the attitude of some extremist groups, but they do not define the broader culture, which is another point that I make in the book when we look at the role of fanaticism. The idea that the fanatic defines the culture is bizarre. The number one rated television shows in the region are movies. After that are soap operas and dramas. Very high up are reality shows and LBC, which has not quite scantily clad, but rather attractive young girls and dance shows and variety music shows are watched everywhere uh, in, in the Middle East. It's the most pop, one of the most popular channels. The notion that Arabs sit at home and go to bed at night hating America, wake up in the morning hating Israel, spend the, 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 the rest of the day watching Al Jazeera or, uh, or, or going to a mosque and hearing a preacher fueling the hatred and making it even worse is a bizarre stereotypical view of a people that we don't understand. The reality is that when we ask them about their priorities and their main concerns in life, they actually they go to bed at night worried about their jobs, they wake up in the morning thinking about their kids, they do things like think about health care and education, those are two of their top rated issues. And when they watch television, they're watching movies and so they actually watch television for the same reason we do, to get entertained. That's their, that's their concern. Now, do they like our policies? No, they don't. And are they angry about our policies? When you talk to them about it, they do. Although it's not something that's on their mind front and center 90% of the day. It's not. Just like, I mean, we could be upset about this or upset about that. I, you know, furious about the Iraq war, still, still. I'm furious about, you know, I, I, I've got my favorites and, and if, you know, if this election doesn't turn out the way I like, I'm going to be upset. But I'm going to go to bed at night worried about my kids and wake up in the morning thinking about my job or vice versa. And I'm going to spend, you know, in my life and I've just got a new grandchild and I'm loving this little baby to death. And, you know, it is, it's who we are. We are a complex people, all of us, this side, that side. It's to understand the fullness of our life that I wanted to write the book. The other great myth is the, the fact that they're stuck and not, not going anywhere. And I use a, uh, when I was at Penn back then, I was taking a course in, in, in Arabic poetry and I, uh, it, it, was a, it was a marvelous course with a marvelous professor and it introduced me to the poetry of the Jahiliya, the pre-Islamic period, that was just quite stunning. And I wrote this long paper about this one poem that I don't remember if he appreciated it or not. I don't think he did, but man, it stuck with me, this one poem. And because it, it, I was taking it at the same time I was taking Anthony Wallace's course, um, and it, it was sort of, um, it sort of made sense in a different way than I think he or or the course intended. It, the poem is, is about a, a, a camel, um, and it's racing across the desert. And he's writing about this poem, this, de this camel r running across the desert. And at one point, the camel stops. And the poet looks at the camel's face and sees fear as the camel looks back to, to the area from which he's come. And he sees that fear, and he says to himself as he's writing about the, 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 the camel, you know, he's afraid of where he's come from. But then the camel looks forward, and he's afraid of where he's going to because he doesn't know where it is. And so in a sense, he's stuck between this not knowing where he's coming from and not knowing where he's going to. That, to me, it actually spoke not of the pre-Islamic time, but probably the time of Muhammad itself with all this dramatic change that was taking place in Mecca. But it also spoke to me of almost any period of great change 
when I looked at the Tea Party and the people going to healthcare, these healthcare town meetings a, a year or so ago, being disruptive, and, and I looked in their eyes and I, and I saw that kind of anxiety. And why not? I mean, this is the worst economic downturn we've had in more than a generation. Beyond that, it's the first generation of Americans who no longer believe that their children will live the same lifestyle that they have themselves become accustomed to. In a sense, the collapse of the American dream. I mean, my children are doing well, but, but by the grace of God. And the fact is, is that they are struggling to keep to the level that they grew up with. And th this sense of a ceiling or a cap on the American dream is something that I think is hard for people to get used to, especially those at retirement age, both who are looking back to their children and seeing they're not going, and also not sure of what they're going to do in their retirement and whether they'll survive or whether their pension plans will even meet their needs as they get into their, 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 their late 60s and 70s, if they live to 80 or 90. How do they survive? And add to that a collapse in the faith of government and the ability of government. All began during the lies that got us into a war which took a, a, a real toll on people, compounded by Katrina, and people saw that as a collapse of the performance of government. And we always had this sense that there was a crisis, I hate government, I hate big government, I hate government, I hate government, but where's the government, you know? And so the notion that the government would be the source of last resort, and they do it, they certainly wouldn't lie to us about this and get our kids killed in a war. They certain what well, they did, and it took a toll. M maybe slight and subtle, but a, the accrual of that toll over a period of time has produced this tremendous sense of anxiety in people. When I hear folks say, it's all about big deficits, or the, the analysts on television, they're angry at the size of government and the budget and the... the, the, the don't, I mean, I've gone to these rallies, I love to talk to people, and I love to listen. They don't know the size of the budget. They don't know the size of the deficit. Yeah, there are some leaders of some of the groups who do. Most people are just deeply concerned about their futures and their lives. That's true here, and it produces anxiety. It's true there, and it produces anxiety. The sense of losing control over your life and not being able to determine your own future is profoundly disturbing to people here and there. So this notion that Arabs are going nowhere, it, it, not, not true. And even when they're going somewhere, they're going so fast that it has taken a toll. I mean, Riyadh. Riyadh, 1955, was a city of about 35, something, 40,000 people. Today it's four and a half million people. In less than 60 years, the growth has been extraordinary and it works. It's got a massive highway system that actually works. It's got an electrical grid that works. It's got water, et cetera, that work. It's got jobs for people and, that work. The fact is, is that, excuse me, that rapid process of urbanization has taken a toll and become very challenging to the, the values and the lives of people who had come from elsewhere. My, my daughter and I, um, the one who just had the baby, were. Um, she came with me uh, about 10 years ago, and we were in the home of a, of a guy who um, was sort of a... Um, everybody from the U.S. military who went into the kingdom sort of had to sit down with this guy, uh, Abdulaziz Tawajri. He was the National Guard, worked with the Crown Prince Abdullah, now King Abdullah. Was an older man, but was somebody who was the, sort of the history of the country wrapped up in one, one, one old guy. and. Um, I've always wanted my kids to meet him, and so I would bring them to him if they ever came with me, just to, to get a feel for him. And, and he was uh, as charming and delightful with stories as ever. And, and uh, at one point, my daughter said to him, I love this house. It was a gorgeous, gorgeous house. And he got a twinkle on his eye, and he said, it can be yours. And she said, what do you mean? And he said, I've got two sons. <laughs> uh, and she said no, she was engaged and she was getting married and, and he said too bad, you know, but if you change your mind, he said you come back. Um, and I noticed a little later in the afternoon that he was sort of looking out a window and I said what's wrong? And uh, he said, I'm thinking about what your daughter said. It is a beautiful house. He said, but there are days when I 
just wish I could be back in the desert under the stars, living in a tent. That was the life I grew up with. And he said, that is the life I still want to live. The, in one generation, in one generation, he went from there to where he is, and there is stress under those circumstances. And I think we've not accounted for a lot of that, how rapid the change has been, and how much progress has been made on so many levels, but all at a cost. And one of the costs is fundamentalism. I mean, remember, in the South, the fundamentalist movements that emerged grew out of the same phenomena of rapid urbanization and social transformation, and people then glorifying a past that probably never was, but wished that they could go back to because it was simpler and purer and it made sense. And it was something they could control. You can always control your fantasies better than you can control reality because reality is out of control most of the time. And so this notion of, 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 of fundamentalism is in fact a phenomenon here, there, it's everywhere. We all do our fundamentalism differently. I mean, the, the Austrians do it with fascism and we do it with a, a kind of a, a, a re religious revitalization, uh, sometimes a bit of nativism. Uh, if those darkies weren't here, we'd all be doing better. Or the people were just like we used to be in our neighborhood. Remember when we were all, I mean, I got guys in my neighborhood, it's an Italian Lebanese neighborhood who decry the fact that Bosnians are coming in. It's not like it used to be when we were all Americans here. Shit, man. Talk to them. I say, you know, guys, come on. My dad, your dad, they came over here. Remember? They didn't, they didn't speak English when we were growing up. What are, you, what are you talking about? It's not like when, it's exactly like we were, like it was when we were kids. Exactly. No difference at all. But there's this sense of taking a past and it was all, it, they wiped that out. And it's just, it was pure, it was simple, it was easy. They knew exactly. Of course, the playground when you're 12 is always easy. You always understand those rules. But that's not who we were then, and it's certainly not where we are now. It's the same with them. It's the same over, over there. Um, so I wrote the book about the myths. Uh, and I ask people tough questions, and I get back answers, and they help me explore those myths about are they angry, are they fanatics, are they, uh, do they want progress and change? And I mean, three quarters in Saudi Arabia say that they support women having more rights in their country. Sixty-something percent say they support equal rights, including men and women. Num and interesting, the numbers for women changed because used to be in Saudi Arabia that women were less favorable of women having more rights than men. And now the numbers are equal, or slightly men ahead by one or two points. Um, and after we look at the myths, we then look at the consequences of those myths. Because the consequences have been dramatic. I mean, if you start with a level of we don't know, and then you compound it with stereotypes that come through the popular culture, through movies and television, and you compound that with the political culture, and you compound that with the media culture, you know? I mean, it used to be that there was a period of time, a brief window back in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, where the networks actually took seriously getting information, but they've now narrowed their Rolodexes so even if I get called to do a show, I'm debating Bill Bennett about the Middle East. And like, what? I mean, it's like he's their regular, he's in their stable of, I don't mean that derogatorily, but I mean, he's in their stable of, of experts, the best political team on whatever. And, but not, not a one of them know anything about the Middle East. I once got a call from, this is, I'm patting myself on the back for a second here, but it, it's like a, I, one of the college I taught at, I was teaching at Davidson College back, back then for just a semester, and they used to call it the Zogby Rule, and it was, I got a call to do Fox News about Afghanistan, and I said, I don't do Afghanistan. I don't know anything about it. And she said, oh, nobody ever says that to us. And I said, well, I do. I don't do things I don't, I don't like to talk about things I don't know anything about. 
And she said, wow, that's interesting. Most people just pick up the newspaper and read it, and then they come on. And we don't actually want you because, and she said this, we're not asking because you're an expert. It's like you're a good talker. And it just annoyed the hell out of me. That notion that, and I've been there before. I mean, I've had these guys. I get to do some show with some guy who's a, a, debating me on NBC Evening News one night during the beginning of the Gulf War back in the 90s. And... He was listed as Middle East expert from Georgetown, and the, 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 the that's you. <laughs> Notice the guilt right away, I assume it's me. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the camera came up, and uh, it was on TV, uh, the, the, we're looking at the monitor, and they said, and we now take you to our correspondent in the region from Dahran, or Damam, rather, and I said, wait, Dahran, Dahran? It's like, what's the, what are they doing in Dahran? And uh, he said, well, they're, 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 so their they're, they're, they're guy is... I said, but Dahran is like Levittown. It's like there's no Arabs. And it's like, it's like you see, you ever watch Little League World Series and there's always a team from Saudi Arabia and they all got blonde hair and you get like a little disconcert, like what's going on here? It's because they're all American kids. It's the single largest colony of Americans living abroad. And they're doing quite well. It looks it actually looks like Levittown, actually a little nicer than Levittown. I was gonna write a I was going for a walk with a friend of mine one night along the coast and the moon was there and I was gonna write this this song, Moon over Ras Tanura. I mean it looked you were like walking in an American park on the coast and it was really cute. But it's not Saudi so I said that. I said it's like it's not Saudi Arabia. And if they wanna get the Saudi story, they should be in the mom. Uh, they should be in, you know, whatever. And he said, oh. And I said, but, but, um, but have you ever, you never been to Saudi Arabia? He said, no. And I said, Iraq? He said, no. I said, Kuwait? N no. And I said, well, but I thought we were talking about this. You know. He'd gone to Hebrew University for a six-month sabbatical from, from Georgetown at one point. It's like that doesn't count actually. It doesn't count, but it, but it does here. It does here, and the guys who are actually telling the stories. I mean, you've got these characters who wrote books. You get Dory Gold writes a book. He's the Israeli ambassador at one point and is spokesman for the prime minister. He writes a book on Saudi Arabia. Never been to Saudi Arabia, obviously. He's an Israeli official can't go. Writes a book about Saudi Arabia. Gets invited to a Senate hearing to testify is on all the networks as an expert on Saudi Arabia. It's, a, it's like a little irritating, a little bit irritating. But you put all those levels on top that we don't know, and that what we don't know is compounded by a political culture and a media culture and a, and a, uh, and a, um, and a, a popular culture that spread these myths and create this sense of knowing, oh, I know what they're like. I mean, because I heard talk about them, or it's received knowledge. Received knowledge can be dangerous if it's not if 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 that's all you're working with, and that is what most of us are are working with. And so, because of that, they were able to sell us the Iraq War. Because of that, they're able to sell us policies that actually don't make sense and have continued to get us in trouble, and continue to dig a hole deeper for our country and ourselves. And so. I look at each of those areas where we've blundered because we don't know. And, and then I end with a couple of chapters that are um, focused on getting it right. Um, and, and the first chapter begins with what government's doing. And I think the president in Cairo laid out a roadmap for change. I mean, he touched all the right buttons. He knew exactly the things that we need to be doing and the stuff we need to be saying. I, I got a, did a radio interview this morning with somebody from here in town, and he said, but there are those who said that uh, the president was apologizing uh, uh, and um, insulting America and appeasing our enemies. And I said, apologizing for Abu Ghraib and torture? Of course we should apologize for torture, but we should apologize not only to them, but to ourselves for having let ourselves down. This is not, and I was on, after the Cairo speech, I was on CNN commentary with Liz Cheney, 
who of course is defensive because her dad is the guy who did it, and she's like indignant that he's apologizing overseas. But the humiliation wasn't caused by Barack Obama. The humiliation was caused by the policies that got us into this position in the first place and that lied us into a war and said, we forgot, we forgot. But they didn't forget that it was six days and it'd be over, that six months and our troops would be out, that it was only gonna cost $2 billion and that we'd just sort of go in, magically depose the dictator, a beacon of democracy would flower, blah, 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 and, and we believed it. I mean, I had two nephews in the, the US military at that point and I could not, I mean, I love these two guys. I worried about them every single day till they came home. And, but I knew that they didn't know. And I knew that as they could not help it because this is what they were being told and I'm listening to television and what we're being told, we saw that war through the prism of World War II. We were liberating Baghdad. We were bringing down the dictator. People don't remember that the statue when it toppled wasn't the Iraqis toppling it. We, we had soldiers on cranes toppling it with a crowd of about 30 Iraqis down below that were mostly followers of Ahmed Shalabi cheering. It was like a staged photo that would live with us then and define that moment. And, it, and would that it were true, that moment, but it wasn't. But we believed it because we had no other information to work with. And when I was in a debate at one point and I said to somebody, I know that we're seeing this through the prism of World War II, but when they see it, their eyes are saying, these are the new Mongols. And the question came back, what does that mean? And the point is that we didn't know their history or culture. I mean, to invade a country and want to occupy a country whose history and culture and people we did not know, that you can have lame brains like like Bill Crystal and Fred Barnes nightly pontificating about, oh, anybody who says that there's going to be a split between the Shia and Sunni, that's just damn pop psychology. People don't know what they're talking about. Um, <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about, sir. And what you're doing is selling the American people a bill of goods so that by the time we're sunk into the quicksand and can't get out, it's too late. And no one will remember. That's what always bothers me about this. Politicians... We do kind of remember sometimes, but with guys on television, we never remember. I mean, we never do a scorecard. Like if they had, like if we did their predictions and their analyses, like we do baseball players, they, they wouldn't only be in the minor leagues. We'd be suing them for like false whatever and for having told us they could play the game to begin with. But it never matters. It's like they just bloviate one night, we forget it the next night, and we have them back again because they're good talkers. And yet the consequences are they shape ideas. They take a public that doesn't know, they create the illusion of knowing, give us the confidence that we do know, and then we trip blindly into the night and get ourselves in trouble, which is what we did. The president understood that. He tried to unravel it. The blowback that he got and that I was dealing with in the debates with Liz Cheney and George Allen and the like on television was unbelievable and I remember saying that at the end of one of the debates on CBS the woman said to me she said do you think he can heal the divide and I said it'll be easier for him to heal the divide over there than it will be with the conservatives here who won't give him a break they're not interested in closing this chapter and healing these divides and that's a tragedy that we're dealing with and I fear after November it'll get even harder maybe even worse and but He's got the right idea, but he was right in a speech. A speech alone isn't going to do it. Hard work has to be done. We have enormous jobs to do. The good news is, is that we've got agencies of government doing the right thing right now. AID programs used to be like the little boy who wants to help the old lady across the street and she didn't want to go. Um, not always a good idea, but the programs now are, are demand driven. We actually go and seek out partnerships. We actually go and give people what they want. Uh, we have agencies that are quasi-governmental, like the Center for Investment and Private Enterprise, doing wonderful work every single day, helping to promote free markets, helping to support the private sector grow, and helping with the ideas of building civil society in countries that want it. Uh, we got universities doing the right thing, but we have problems. I mean, look, 2,400 
2,400 four-year colleges surveyed, 60 of them with Middle East programs, 60. 2,400 students studying Arabic at a level that they can get language proficiency. More people studying ancient Greek than studying Arabic. Nothing against ancient Greek, it's a nice language. Some of my best friends <laughs> took it and studied it. But, I mean, come on, you know? And it's not for lack of wanting, it's that it's not there. The resources aren't there. Chicago Council on Global Affairs did a study and found after 9-11, kids were asking the right questions, they wanted to take the right courses, the teachers weren't trained, the courses weren't available, and the materials weren't produced. And even now there's blowback, Texas Board of Education that actually has a, a super role in terms of shaping what is in textbooks. And after dealing with evolution, and they now turn to the Arab world and Islam, and they passed a resolution to dumb down textbooks and take Islam out. Um, because they thought it was, it was sort of giving too much play to this an religion antithetical to our own. Um, but, like I said, there are groups fighting back, and I mentioned them, and I talk about in the last chapter, after talking about the corporations that get it right, and the universities that are getting it right, and people in the media who are getting it right, I do a final chapter on what you can do. And I have a resource list of what people can do in organizations that people can join, and things that they can do. I, I, I think, for example, you know, I'm a big fan of the World Affairs Councils. I'm going there tonight. I'm a big fan of the Foreign Policy Association and their great decision series. I think any time citizens come together to debate and learn and work with their colleagues in developing understanding of regions of the world uh, and participate in these kinds of exchanges, it's really important. And that's the book. Um, I hope it encourages you to buy it, use it, um, and uh, and I, if you have questions, I'll take some now. But then what I'd love to do is uh, give you my email address, and if you've got questions, come to me with them. Okay? Thank you. Uh, it's great to have Jim here. Just two quick things, or three quick things. First, this talk is sponsored by the Center for Arab Islamic Studies and the Political Science Department at Villanova. Villanova is one of those schools that is doing it right. We've got a student here who speaks Arabic into our program. So it works. So we're one of the uh, schools, one of the sixes uh, that are doing it. Uh, so welcome, uh, welcome to Villanova. And uh, Jim is gonna stay, as he said, right now for some questions, and then he's gonna sign the books. They're only 20 bucks. It's a bargain. Buy one now. Buy one for Christmas, for holidays. So, questions? So you, you got to go to this blackberry. No, it was my wife. I'm waiting to hear about our daughter, our, our granddaughter. Yes. I, I enjoyed your talk a lot. Thank you. I have two questions. Can you stand up so other people can hear your question? I have two questions. The first question is uh, further related to what you talked about. And it's related to what Jimmy Carter wrote in one of his books that uh, during the... Uh, the Arab unification between Egypt and Syria and Jordan, with Nasser being in charge at that time, there was a resolution for the Syrian Air Force to bomb the Palestinians in Jordan in order to prevent, in order to topple the Jordanian uh, king. And so, the, at that time, the Minister of Defense was Hafez al Assad. And he refused the order. And two years later, or one year later, he became the president of Syria. The school was successful. So the first question is, what is the relationship between Israel, Assad government, and the U.S.? And what happened over the years that it became? Uh, you know, I think the insinuation by Carter was that there was some sort of a relationship. And then what happened over the years that the relationship became more? Well, I haven't read the Carter book. Um, and I don't know. Uh, the, the, what we, you know, I, I, d I don't know myself what he's saying. Um, although I should see him in the next couple of uh, weeks, and so I, 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 I might take a look at the book. I should actually should take a look at the book before I see him. Um, I don't think there's a relationship necessarily. I mean, Assad was not a fan of the PLO. Was not a fan of uh, of Yasser Arafat. I don't think wanted to see a uh, a regime headed by them uh, to his south. Um, he also. Um, I think made some threatening uh, moves during the Black September period in a, in a similar way um, that was, uh, I think, you know, of, of concern to the Palestinian movement at the time, but 
but one the U.S. looked favorably upon. And remember, I mean, he 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 he, um, he historically sided with uh, groups against the PLO, even in Lebanon, where I mean, it, as late as the late the late eighties, when the the Battle of the Camps, the mid eighties, the Battle of the Camps, as it was called. Uh, with, sided with an offshoot. I mean, I think that the, the, his wing of the Ba'ath Party had aspirations to be the dominant force, didn't want a competitor force. I, I don't know, I don't know that event, uh, and I, I will take a look at that because it's intriguing, but I don't think, I think it's more explainable without Israel as a factor or a Syrian-Israeli uh, collaboration as much as it is his own politics and his own movement's aspirations more than it is uh, U.S. or Israeli driven. And it w if it fit with what Israel wanted and what the U.S. wanted, that was, you know, that was, uh, that was something else. But I, I, that would be more, to my way of thinking, more coincidental than it would have been um, a, uh, a, a, a sort of a deliberate conspiracy. And, and, the, and the successful coup was just certain. The, the, the successful coup that happened a year later. Not serendipitous at all, uh, but it was led by you know disgruntled officers who wanted to project a particular political line in the country. My, my second quick question is the you, you were at the beginning during your polling you said that a lot of Americans don't understand what yeah. what, it, what Arabs are in your polling. Uh, I'm from the Middle East, and sometimes I have difficulty understanding. Can you elaborate about what? What is the, your definition of an Arab? I don't know if I'd give you a definition, I, although I think it would be language-based. It would probably, um, uh, I, I sometimes think the more precise term is the Arabic-speaking peoples. Um, Edward Said used to say that he was a Christian by faith and a, and a Muslim by culture, and that came from that Arabic heritage uh, that spread that language and spread the values and the... Um, and, and I kind of love it when I'm with people from different Arab countries and they're all arguing how different they are, but they're arguing about it in very similar ways. Um, I, I, I think there is there are some germs of a common culture that can't be denied. When people talk about the language and the dialects, etc., I mean, it's not unlike, um, you know, Brooklynese and Cockney or Brooklynese even in a southern drawl from, from South Texas. Um, I mean, if you're in the South, you know the difference between, you know, the Georgia and the Arkansas and the South Texas. But if you're from the North, they all sound the same. Um, but people from one can't understand the other. But it's the same in the Arab world. But there is a common language that is used in media that does communicate. Um, and with a common language comes certain common threads of culture. Um, more than that, there are these common political concerns that are shared. Um, maybe not all in the same way, but what we find is that Palestine is important and Iraq is important. Uh, and when we ask why they're important, what people tell us is because it's happening to people like them. And I've used this ex example that sometimes people, some folks will wax indignant, but I, 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 I explain it and I hope that they don't. I, I, I mean, there was, I'll just say it. I think that the Arab attitude toward Palestine and the Arab recent attitude toward Iraq is not unlike the way that American Jews dealt with the Holocaust. Now, it was not a Holocaust in either case, and I do not want to, in any case, create the sense that, that the, the tragedy that has befallen Palestinians for lo these many generations or the Iraqis in the last uh, 20, 30 years, Saddam and, and beyond, um, in any way compares with what happened uh, in, in, in Europe uh, to the Jewish people. It doesn't at all compare. But where the comparison is, is in the sense you had of being either distantly related or personally related to people there who were very much like you and saw some tragedy befalling them and felt powerless to do anything about it. I mean, when I know people in the Gulf who, when they saw the Gaza thing in 2006 and then in 2008, it, they cried because those little kids looked like their kids. They felt a bond 
it was people like them and it was happening to them. And what it did was it not only reminded them of their vulnerability, their sense of history out of control, their sense of betrayal, um, it, it also reminded them of a history that was in many ways shared by that broader region. And so it, it is, it's there. And like I say, I mean, we ignore it and we dismiss it, but we do so at grave peril because it is a deeply felt experience across that region that's there. That's where I find the commonality. And that's, I would define it in other words as a, as a, as a common set of feelings of political concerns um, born of a, of a language that has created an identity. I wouldn't come up with a more precise definition, but those would be the elements. It's not a race, it's not a racial thing. I grew up with that sense, you know, that you are Lebanese and you are Phoenician. Actually, the, the National Geographic study, everybody in the whole region has got the same, you know, the same genetic uh, component. And the Arabs were the Bedouin, you know, and they imposed. You know, it's like, at this point, it's like who's, we're mixed with. I don't, I don't know what I got. You know, <laughs> I know my mom. I know my dad. I know my, my 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 mom does the family tree going back to the 1700s. Um, I got that part down, but I'm not into making genetic uh, arguments about purity or distinctness. For uh, to have my own personal myth of origins, you know, that sort of set me apart. Um, Questions.